Hello, everybody, and welcome to the McDonald Lurie Institute's uh, webinar series uh, on Indigenous people and the natural resource economy. My name is Ken Coates. I'm a, um, uh, a senior fellow uh, with the uh, with the McDonald Lurie Institute. Been working in this field for a very long time. We have a wonderful seminar webinar set up for you today on on Indigenous peoples and critical minerals. Um, all you have to do is pay five minutes attention to the newspapers recently, and there's an awful lot of conversation going on about critical minerals, indigenous involvement, approval processes, barriers to development, uh, success stories, conflicts and things of that sort. We've got two wonderful uh, guests with us today who are going to answer a series of my questions, but also questions that audience members have sent in. I should just indicate to you that if you do have questions as you go along, if you type it into the chat, it'll actually get sent to me. And if we have a chance, we'll get to it. We've got uh, a number of you sending questions ahead of time, and I really, really appreciate that. Let me introduce our, our two um, uh, speakers, if we uh, put them up on the screen here right away. J.P. Gladeau is the, the founder and principal of Mokwete, which is one of uh, Canada's uh, most exciting and interesting Indigenous consultancies. Um, he previously was the president and CEO of the Canadian at the Keating Council for Aboriginal Business. Um, JP has got his incredible background, started life as a forester, um, worked, uh, he's from the Sandpoint First Nation in, uh, in Lake Nipigon, Ontario. Uh, wonderful experience in the business world, but also on the land. And if you, JP's a fascinating guy that half the time you, you, you're talking to him, he's just stepped out of a boardroom, and the other half the time he's got either a rifle in his hand or a fishing rod. Um, doesn't know how to use either of them very well, but he does spend a lot of time they're working on it. So JP has a huge amount of experience in the mining sector. He's on the board of, of Suncor and the board of the Institute for Corporate Directors uh, with Borden Mining as well. And has been at other companies like uh, Ontario Power Generation and Norant in the past. Fabulous background, fabulous experience. And JP, so delighted to have you here. And I, I hope that Chloe gets to watch you from some time to see what you're doing with her. Your, the rest of your life. Um, Thanks, Jason, Jason Thompson is the president and CEO of Superior Strategies. And Jason, delighted to have you with us here today. Um, he's a member of the Red Rock Indian Band, um, has a huge amount of about 20 years experience in, as in sort of the engineering side and the business development side, um, and, and is known very widely as for his skill as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur and his visionary approach to, to resource, resource development. Mm -hmm. um, he, he, been involved with a company called Warrior Engineering Limited, where he was uh, president again, of that one as well, uh, Jason, um, and actually even has an apparel line, which I think is really, really neat. I think Jason JP is going to borrow that from you and sort of try to get his own apparel. <laughs> I've bought some stuff from Jason. He's, he's amazing. <laughs> well, it's wonderful. So anyway, we're delighted to have both of you with us. Um, I, I'm going to introduce each of them to sort of do give a bit of an opening statement so we get their perspective on what the issues are. I will then ask them a whole series of questions, interspersed with questions from the audience. And toward the end, I'll come back to you, uh, Jason and JP, and give you a sort of one minute to wrap up and make any comments that sort of arose out of our, our conversation. Uh, and then we'll sign off. So I always do promise everybody it's an hour long webinar. We'll stop at precisely at the hour, uh, an hour from now. So um, JP, if it's okay, I'd turn to you first. And you're sure. open. Thanks, thanks, Ken. It's always uh, good to be on the screen or in the room with you. Um, thanks to the MLI for hosting these webinars. These are really important conversations and you guys are doing uh, fantastic work uh, across the sectors and the ideas. A fun little fact, Jason and I are actually, right, so we're distantly related cousins. Um, he's from Red Rock First Nation, which is just about 45 minute drive south of where I'm calling in from today on the reserve here at Sandpoint. It's been a remarkable uh, few decades uh, Jason and I have been at these issues for some time, myself over 30 years now, and the last five to 10 years have been truly remarkable. When we look at the advancement of the Indigenous economy and the advancement of our people, our businesses, but I think most importantly, the response or the, um, the way that industry uh, has been working with us has certainly shifted, um, and I'll be really interested in hearing Jason's uh, point of view on this from um, you know, basically being on the peripheral of any kind of development where companies will come in, mining companies, develop the resources, um, leave us with a mess uh, and leave us with no jobs or opportunities or, or revenue. And actually essentially leaving us in a worse place than we started to today where we're talking about partnerships, we're talking about equity, we're talking about tertiary opportunities to plug into mines. Um, 
and I, and I think largely they understand. Um, there's this great tagline that came from the First Nation Major Projects Coalition uh, conference a couple of years ago, which I think also applies to the mining sector, any part of the Crown land or our traditional territories, and that all past a net zero run through the traditional territories of our communities. These are our, these are our backyards. Most of Canada is treated, and our rights have been hard fought. And, and we were recognized in Canada's constitution. And industry has finally figured it out. I think largely that if they're going to build certainty into their models, into their, into their plans, into their projects, that they've got to find ways to work with us progressively, rebuild that trust. And government's role is to create the policy, to create opportunities for us to work together, not to divide us. We still have a lot of um, division, not only between industry and communities, but I think within communities. And, you know, we've, we've got some big learnings ahead of us, I think, but um, the, the, the world is, is needing these critical minerals and they are in our backyard. So we've got to find a way that, um, we, that we um, actually develop these sustainably and, uh, and develop our communities, which have been pretty much um, for a very long time on the peripheral of society. Now we're finding ourselves at the epicenter and it's an incredible, exciting place to be. Oh, thanks, JP. Excitement and, and nervous making at the same time. You know, yeah. if, 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 if these arrangements are not done well, they're done poorly, and the legacies will be rest not with the mining companies and southern Canadians, but they'll rest with the community members. Um, Jason, uh, your opening thoughts, please. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again. Uh, very much appreciated, uh, and thanks for having the opportunity to speak today and be on a panel with JP. I say we've known each other for quite some time since we were little kids. Uh, Running around the res, snotty nose, snotty nose, and all that good stuff. But now look at us. We're still looking young. Hey, JP. That's <laughs> 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 uh, great. I, I'm actually uh, coming to you from uh, from Toronto here. I'm, I'm attending the Indigenomics Conference, so I apologize if there's some background noise. Um, but you know what? This is day two of an exciting conference, and it, it kind of, you know, it, the timing of this webinar and attending this conference just fit in quite nicely. Uh, I've learned a lot. Um, listening to some shared stories, successes, but, you know, again, a message of still there's much work to be done, but I'm, I'm very optimistic. As JP mentioned, you know, there's a, these are very exciting times um, and challenging and, and nerve wracking, I guess, all in the same boat. But we definitely see um, the potential, right? And, and I'm, a, I'm a true believer that, you know, in this era of reconciliation, that if we don't get it right now, we won't get it right and and that honestly is exciting but also scary um you know as i look at you know what we've achieved and and, and the potential opportunities that are ahead of us it's game changing it could potentially be game changing you know bringing our communities from one of poverty to prosperity and i think that's the important aspect of things i think we as all canadians want to live a good healthy life and uh, that includes us as indigenous folks you know regardless of the uh, the harm and challenges we face, you know, through the course of history, we can still tackle, we still tackle every day with a smile and uh, of, of a feeling of hope and optimism. And, you know, uh, that, you know, speaks well to, you know, the, our ancestors and, and the leaders and, and folks that came before us. So again, I think we owe it all. And I think JP would, would definitely echo this is that, you know, we owe it all to the folks that, you know, endured some tough times that, you know, we can create a path that's a lot more positive and prosperous for our youth. Like I said, I'm excited, you know, the messages that are coming out loud and clear from corporate Canada, you know, through you know, JP's, JP's involvement with OPG uh, on the board, we're seeing some some change and, you know, uh, some very positive change. And I go Hydro One, another prime example of a large uh, corporation that's getting it. And you're actually seeing action now, and it's not just words on a, on a piece of paper, or an RFQ. So that's exciting. And, you know, for, for all of us is we want to build capacity. We want, we want to all prosper. And unfortunately, you know, we still deal with the, the effects of colonization, but, you know, again, you know, reconciliation is not going to be easy. It's going to be work. It's not, you know, cutting a donation check and patting yourself on the back. The efforts of reconciliation, it's going to be work. It's going to be hard work. Um, we're committed to it. You know, we, you know, basically you know, committed our career and, and the work we do to that. Um, but we do have a lot of strong allies within the corporate community and uh, it's exciting. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist and I believe that 
you know, the future is bright for our youth. And, you know, the the old image of the reservation um, is going to change to one of, of, of prosperity. And I'm, I'm, I'm very excited for what that future holds, you know, not only for my kids, my grandkids and, and the kids that are the kids to come. So I'm, I'm excited for that. So thanks for the opportunity. Oh, Jason, thank you. Thank you so much. The balance that both of you have struck between sort of, I would call it realism and optimism, right? Um, uh, that is resilience is the dominant theme in the hi history of indigenous people in this country. Um, you, you've been stomped on a lot over time, right? And you keep bouncing back. And it <laughs> seems to me that the issue that what I find so exciting about right now is you actually can have the conversations about resource development, you know, in a way that sort of addresses the challenges of the past, but also adds this new element of the challenge of managing prosperity. You know, indigenous communities are being successful. And then you have a very different set of issues, don't you? When you're looking at sort of what do you do when you have the dollars coming in and have employment and business opportunities. So let me ask a series of questions. Um, and again, I'll intersperse those with ones that come in from, from our audience members. But JP, you know, this phrase min critical minerals gets thrown around a lot. Let's make sure we're all talking about the same thing. So what, is, what does that mean, critical minerals, and why the pressure all of a sudden? Because, boy, the last three or four years, it's just cranked up like crazy. It was real sense of urgency about getting these minerals to market. So what's going on? Well, we can't also forget about the critical communities in which the critical minerals are are, are situated. But critical minerals, the cobalt, nickel, uh, lithium, um, making um, batteries. Uh, if we're talking about... Uh, uh, energy transition, if we're talking about uh, global security with all the chips and uh, defense, I mean, our world is, uh, is seems to be more divided than ever these days. Um, all those minerals are incredibly critical to um, the sovereignty of our nations, the ability for us to produce uh, energy, the ability to defend, etc. Um, and these minerals are, uh, are often found in other states around the world like china has a lot of critical minerals um and we've got a partner to to the south of us um that has got a, a hunger for it as well and uh, having uh, geopolitical alliances uh, is a really important part of this conversation as well um and the word critical it, itself means that uh, there's some time pressure there's uh there's there's lack resources um and then you tie in um um the whole uh, demand to reach net zero. Um, there's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of pressure to get these minerals out of the ground. Yep. Uh, and the pressure to, to work with community now um, is really important as well. But when you, there's a really interesting conversation going on in our communities and, and, you know, kind of alluded to it earlier, can like, well, you know, we should have been having these relationships a long time ago. Uh, now we're at a critical mass and now you want to try and figure it out and how to work with First Nations now and Inuit and Métis communities. This is, uh, this is a little late to the game, so it's a lot of pressure to get this right. Yeah, that's, that's really, really well said, JP. And, and Jason, I'm just going to turn this around on you, if you don't mind, because it's kind of um, from a First Nations perspective or Métis community, Inuit community, whatever. What does that pressure feel like at the community level? I know you, you can hear politicians talking about it. we've got to get these things to market. You get business leaders saying we need these things urgently, right? Everybody's so excited about them. And yet you got a community up there. All of a sudden, the miners are banging on your door saying we want to get at that resources. What does that feel like at the community level? Well, I think, you know, even from from a business perspective, like we get inundated daily with people reaching out, looking to partner with Indigenous businesses because you're seeing that in the RFQs that are coming out. You know, as we talk about ESG and all that great stuff that's, you know, hopefully will help build inclusion. Um, but think about it from a community perspective when, you know, you've been excluded for, for years and you don't have the resources, technical resources and ability to really, you know, jump in and, and you know, get to do the work, right? Like we've been excluded for a long time. So getting inundated and saying, you know what, we got to get this done yesterday. And why are you dragging your feet? Well, at the end of the day, a lot of our communities are dealing with social issues and social challenges, you know, from the opioid crisis to mental health issues, you name it, right? So for us, um, in a lot of our communities, it, it really is a, a lack of resources. And again, like I mentioned earlier, we're still dealing with the effects of colonization. So that's a challenge in itself, right? I've always said our people are not anti-development, we're anti-exclusion. And, you know, and the fact that we haven't been a part of this game, we don't have the history and knowledge and experience that, you know, some of these companies that have had, that's been going on for generations, 
it's going to take time. There's going to be a, a, a learning curve that has to be addressed. Um, and it's going to need to be very transparent. You know, um, I believe that, you know, as soon as the thought it has come to mind that we're going to look to develop a mine or develop a project, but the communities need to be included. We need to be a part a partnership, and it is a partnership. If you're looking to come to me to, to form a partnership or you come to a community to form a partnership, you know, a partnership for me, I've been married for 27 years. Um, I've been with my wife since high school. And, uh, you know, if I only invited her out when I needed her to join me for a movie or a steak dinner, I would be married 27 years. And I think that's the same way it has to be included when you talk about partnerships with communities, right? It can't be just, you know, when you need a partner or when, you know, a company reaches out to us when they need somebody to partner with them to answer an RFQ so they get the Indigenous points. It doesn't work that way, right? It, it, it's, again, it's got to be a commitment. It's got to be one where there's, um, it's, it's a win-win for everybody. And I think we lose sight of that. You know, for us, we've been very welcoming as Indigenous people since the first settlers arrived on our shores. You know, we've probably been the most trustful people in the history of history of the world. And unfortunately, we keep getting taken advantage of. So again, if there are some, you know, um, the response is to, to drag your feet a touch and, and you're kind of unsure of moving forward and, and trust is an issue, do you blame the community? Really? <laughs> so again, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's about building a relationship. Um, you know, building that relationship, getting to know the community, getting to know some of the challenges, what, what, what's facing the communities. And I think once you develop that sense of trust, you build that relationship. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, access to capital has always been a challenge. That's getting uh, to be uh, uh, something that's definitely improving. So I think at the end of the day, though, again, you, you have to have some patience. We've been excluded for a long time. But I do believe there is willingness to to work to get a, a project done and underway in a positive manner because nobody wants to be protesting or or causing any project delays. But again, at the end of the day, you have to understand that, you know, we haven't been a part of this. We've been excluded for a long time. So if that changes, that um, thought process changes where it's one of, of, of transparency and true partnership, then I think a lot of these projects will move ahead and probably, you know, move ahead at a, at a much faster pace when you have the community backing, you know, permitting instead of, you know, fighting against permitting, right? Nobody wants those delays. Yeah, that's a really great description, actually. I really, really appreciate that a lot because it's uh, it's quite a fascinating contrast between the mining companies and governments across the country who are saying, get these things done right away, and the community is saying, when you did things fast in the past, it didn't work out very well for us. So we're going to ask you to take things slowly. And of course, you know, these are very different kinds of things. So JP, let me put it back to you you've been on the board of a number of different mining companies and and you know about the mining process and the permitting process that jason just referred to um my understanding is that canada has some of the longest timelines in the world for getting mines into production that that we talk sometimes in decades not in years in terms of getting a mine from exploration all the way through through the development so give us a bit of a sense of the processes involved from the, the mining company i always i always wonder too if Canadians really understand how many tens of millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars a mining company has to raise and invest and spend just to get to the starting point where they actually can develop a mine. So can you walk us through that a little bit? I can do it. I can do it a little bit for sure. I mean, a lot, a lot of the companies out there are junior companies, uh, the ones that are out exploring in the backyards of our community. So they're, you know, they're constantly going to the market to, uh, raise capital so they can do their drilling programs to actually prove out the resource. Um, the challenge has been that they're so, a lot of them are relatively small, don't have the deeper pockets to engage in a meaning, well, engage in a deeper way that's necessary to actually build the relationships with communities because their main focus is let's prove out the resource. And so they're not incentivized enough to um, spend the time and resources to build those relationships with communities. And it is a challenge. I mean, that is changing for sure. Um, so they've got to be able to, to through the, they've, they've got to actually spend a certain amount of dollars to actually prove out the resource. And as they build up that and they start proving out um, what the resources is, they've got to continue to attract capital so that they can actually build out uh, the um, um uh, as they're going through the permitting process at the same time, but they also have to prove out the feasibility of their project. And then they're also fighting uh, commodity prices in their products. So hitting it at the right time, getting the right capital into, into the shop, proving that you can get it done. 
um, is a really big challenge. Um, in the permitting process, again, if I look at Rock Tech Lithium here, it was a mining company, they're operating our territory. Um, our First Nations actually are partnered, uh, Red Rock, uh, Rocky Bay, Sandpoint and Partridge Lake are all partnered on one development corporation to um, work with Rock Tech Lithium. But they've got to approve all the road permitting processes and they got to continue to find ways to actually raise capital so that they can actually develop the resource. So they'll have to come up with a feasibility plan. They'll have to do a business plan. And then they still have to go to the market to get all that, all the financial resources to, uh, to develop it. And a lot of them will get bought out. Some of them will get bought out by larger companies. Uh, case in point with Noron, um, you know, we were very thin on resources near the end of our time. Um, this is the project Ring of Fire, which has, has uh, you know, the Eagle's Nest project is, is one of the biggest nickel plays in the world. And um, there's a whole bunch of uh, opportunities up in the north. Um, and, you know, the company like... Um, um, Wailu Metals has come in now, uh, and uh, Andrew Forrest, and there was a little bit of a bidding war between them and BHP. Um, they came out on top, and uh, now they own the asset, um, and they 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 don't have to go looking for 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 money because they're a very large organization. They are now putting time and effort and energy into developing the relationships with the communities, finding ways that they're actually going to be able to. Um, um, build out the resource, their energy, what, are the, what does a road look like, um, although that's mostly in the hands of the communities through an environmental assessment process. But that company is, um, has a deeper, deeper pocket, has deeper pockets to actually invest in the project in the communities. So there's a whole spectrum of companies. The, the company that I'm fortunate to sit on, a, a small um, um, base metals uh, company in the Yukon, and we know our first starting point is the First Nations. They are our first gate. We don't go pretty much more. We're still proving out the resource at the same time, but we are putting time and resources into making sure that our relationships with the local communities, because we know uh, if we don't have that relationship and, and they don't see themselves in the project benefiting and oversight on mitigating impacts, we're not going to get anywhere. So, um, you know, that's that's a primary um, uh, goal for us to make sure that we've got those relationships intact and working with the federal government uh, or sorry, the, the uh, Yukon government as well. Um, in permitting. So there's a lot of moving pieces and it's a very complex system. And unfortunately it takes a very long time. And sometimes capital is looking for places to go. And if you've got to wait 15, 20 years on return, they're going to invest somewhere else. That's just the way that capital yeah. works. But JP, you did, there's a really great description and you got some fascinating sort of questions there. Um, sorry about folks that my camera's doing odd things and I show up only in a corner. I'm a pretty big guy and I've still still managed to fill up the screen. Um, so, but JP, when you're talking about this, it's got two things strike me as the mine you're working on in the Yukon. Um, the previous experience with the mine in that area was very, un, very unfavorable. Nice. Um, and of course, the community is now really concerned about any mine, any mine in their territory is we know what happened with the previous mine. It's really upsetting, right? The other thing, and I'm sure you've seen this, you know, you and Jason have seen this as well, is that sometimes the mines that nobody's come under their territory for 60 years, and then they show up and all of a sudden say, hey, we found something. And the community has to learn about companies right from the very beginning. So, you know, these things have very different reactions. Sometimes the, the history is a, a bad thing, and sometimes the absence of a history makes it really hard to know where to go from, go, go forward, right? Yeah. So, Jason, let me, let me turn this to you, that... Um, you know, um, the, the, a project comes along really quickly. Walk us through what a community has to do to sort of come on board. What, are the, what, what decision making process, what structures do they go through? Is this a question of phone the chief and the chief says, yep, good idea. He signs a form and off it's done. Um, what, what kind of consultations have to be done with community members? I think every every community is quite unique in how they advance these discussions, as we're seeing with Ring of Fire and, and you know, I give a lot of respect to every community. They have a different viewpoint. And I think that's the important aspect of of, of engagement, meaningful engagement, is that respecting the authenticity of every community, right? The traditional values, the, you know, traditional areas, hunting, fishing, trapping, you know, things that have been going on for, for decades and hundreds of years, actually, and respecting that. So I don't, I don't think there's any one cookie cutter approach to how you engage with community. Um, I think at the end of the day, I really believe and truly believe that we as Indigenous communities need to develop the rules of engagement and identify, you know, if you're working in our territory, in our traditional territory, that these are what these are what we expect to be followed. These are the, you know, when it comes to meaningful consultation, this is what we expect. 
right? And I think if we can clearly identify what those goalposts are, it will not only be a value to the community, it'll also be a, a value to the developer, right? I, I've seen a huge difference here locally in the Thunder Bay region um, relative to engagement by some of the uh, junior mining companies, exploration companies, um, especially the folks coming out of Australia, relative to engagement and uh, inclusion. You know, they're coming in here with a willingness to learn more so than we've seen in the past. And that, for me, is uh, definitely um, a positive uh, trend that we're seeing. I, I'm witnessing it firsthand. Um, but again, at the, at the community level, I think the communities are still, you know, they, they've been, they're a little jaded. So they're still, you know, kind of tiptoeing ahead here. What does that look like, right? And from, from the industry perspective, they're sitting there going, well, you know, we want meaningful engagement as well, but what does that look like? So I really truly believe that as Indigenous communities um we have to probably be a little bit more so on the offensive so that we're ready for development and we have the tools in place the resources in place um technical financial you name it so that we can take advantage of every opportunity you know because i think far too long if you ask me my own opinion i think far too long we've been sitting on the outside allowing industry government to dictate those rules of engagement and i think the path forward is to sit there going, you know what, we're going to be the ones dictating this because, you know, in all reality, every time we sit in a meeting, at the, we do a land acknowledgement and we acknowledge the traditional territory of whatever nation we're talking. So that's well documented. So, again, I think if we if we determine what the rules of engagement are, right, again, I think it's, it's positive for everybody. And, again, it'll help expedite potentially any, any future project. So... Jason, you touched on what I think is the most revolutionary aspect of what's going on right now. And then for a long time, it's like, what are the federal rules? What are the provincial rules? What are the territorial rules, right? And the biggest change that's happening right now is this indigenous communities are actually going to be writing their own laws and writing their own resource development laws. And I hope at some point, my, my vision of where this goes is that a province or a federal government looks at this and says, boy, you know, the folks at Sandy Point, their rules and regulations are tougher than ours. So we're going to make our rules and regulations subordinate to theirs because they have the they have the toughest ones, the most appropriate ones, the most regionally sensitive ones. And I think, Jason, you've talked on something that's really valuable. And, and the communities are increasingly doing that. They are writing their own resource laws. And then at least the mining companies or the resource companies say, if we want to get involved with them, we know what the rules are. We, we, you know, they, they told us what the ground rules are as we go forward. Really, really interesting. So, um, JP, if I could, I'm asking a question here. Uh, 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 Ralph asked a question here about the, so you, there are the obvious economic benefits, but the, one of the biggest issues around mineral development has to do with land reclamation and remediation. And so if you get a look at northern Canada, the remediation economy is now almost as large as the mining economy because there's so many mines that were developed in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s that were done very poorly. So now we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars fixing those up. You know, so what, how much assurance can mining companies provide that, in fact, the reclamation will be undertaken and completed properly? Well, they should be engaging the communities in the very beginning. When we think about procurement, supply chain, companies need to be, again, the starting point um, is with the community because that's going to help you advance uh, your project in a more certain way. Uh, you've, you both alluded to it uh, eloquently, so thank you. Um, and then when you think about procurement, right from the inception to the operate, to the, sorry, the construction, to the operations, to the decommissioning, and to the land reclamation, there has to be Indigenous oversight through all of that. Um, and I'll just back up a little second before I get into to like the, the assurances. Um, we talk about tr incorporating traditional knowledge. Like, you know, since I've moved home on my reserve the last three and a half years, my knowledge of the land is gone up exponential. It's only been three and a half years that I'm out here all the time. I'm watching the weather patterns. I'm watching the fish patterns, watching the animal movements. Um, and I'm just watching how the environment is moving around me. And I can only, you know, when I talk to the older people that have been on this land for a longer time and passing down the knowledge generation over generation, that knowledge needs to be carried forward, but not in a way that is subservient to Western science. It's all about making space for both knowledge systems because they don't always connect. They don't always communicate. They don't fit sometimes. So it's just about making room for the knowledge holders in, uh, in, in projects. So if you go to reclamation, who better else to like 
reclaim the land than the people that have been on the land for thousands of years. People that have been growing up on the land. They, they've seen what good and excellent looks like and they see what terrible looks like. And having the indigenous companies from a procurement perspective, actually the ones uh, reclaiming the land, it gives, it gives the companies assurance. But I think more importantly, I mean, if we look at indigenous people globally, we're 5% of the population with 80% of the biosphere in our backyards. <laughs> we can give assurances to the world that indigenous people are the ones that are making sure the lands are getting back to where they were supposed to be. And that's a beautiful assurance, I would think. That's a fantastic one, actually. And I mean, it has, I, I'm, I'm a very pragmatic sort of person. It also yeah. means that there's the, the last stage of the, the jobs and looking after the land. This is now looking after the land, not for one year. You're looking after it for generations. And some, you know, the, the mining company has to put the money aside to pay for that yes. monitoring and regulation for a long time, which then expands the economic benefit far beyond the immediate and short term. Yeah. And the companies need to make sure they're putting money aside for reclamation and, and they've gotten off the hook in the past. And that can happen again. Yep. That, great stuff. Great stuff. Jason, um, when, when you talk about this mineral development right now, a lot of this stuff is happening on Indigenous land and happening to Indigenous people, which just seems like is a perpetuation of the things of the past. Do you see a place or a time when Indigenous peoples will be doing the development themselves, or at least leading the development in partnership with Canadian or international partners? Are we, are we still, a lot of what I see is Indigenous communities responding to outsiders. Do you, do you see a change happening where we're going to get to the point where a, a, a First Nation or a Métis or any community is going to say, we're developing this mine, we invite some people in? Yeah, definitely. I think case in point is exactly what we're talking about here in, in Toronto at the Indigenomics Conference. I don't think that's that many years away, to be totally honest with you, Ken. I think that, you know, we've we've gained the knowledge, we've, we've understood, and we're putting in the, you know, the the framework around meaningful engagement, meaningful consultation, and finding the right partners to make this happen. So I, I don't think it's that far off. I truly believe that, again, like I mentioned earlier, right? We, we're not anti-development, we're anti-exclusion. Let us, let us be a part of this. We wanna be a part of, of, of the economy. We wanna be a part of prosperity. I've heard this from a number of chiefs, I'm sure JP, the same thing, right? Is that we wanna be prosperous. We, we, we wanna be a part of the project. You know, I think our challenge sometimes is, is helping the, uh, our elders understand the opportunities that are here because, you know, again, they've experienced a lot of hardship throughout their, their lifetime. And, you know, so it's gonna take some time, but I definitely think that, you know, the conversation around, you know, participation and inclusion are definitely changing. I was very fortunate, uh, our, our keynote, uh, one of our keynote speakers yesterday um, at the event was Bill Gallagher. And this gentleman has done some tremendous work um, as a non-Indigenous person, but bringing the Indigenous voice to the table to ensure that we are being included, right? You talk about, you know, the effects of climate change and JP alluded to that, right? We see it every day. You talk to the Northern remote communities that, you know, winter roads are a vital part of their sustainability and they're eroding quickly. So that concern is, is, is alive and well, and, you know, it's important. And that's what, you know, one of the reasons why we created Warrior Engineering was, you know, first of all, to introduce our Indigenous folks to more of the technical side of things, but it's also to ensure that traditional knowledge and, uh, and bringing Western science together is vitally important, yep. right? And that hasn't been happening. So I think that's honestly, if we look at, you know, resource development in a truly meaningful way, and, you know, those of you who've worked in, in the Indigenous um, environment for a long time, here are seven generations. That's truly what we believe, right? It's not today. The impacts are going to be felt down the road. And if we're not looking out for that today, you know, we're going to feel those impacts. And we are right now, right? You know, case in point, you know, what's happened out in, in Grassy Narrows and, and, you know, from, you know, really disastrous forestry experiences that are continuing to harm our community. So, Again, I think for us, you know, we have to be at the table. We, you know, that's why I applaud JP and, and, and our other colleagues that are at the table voicing those concerns and ensuring that, hey, we, we want to see this move forward. We want to see projects move forward, but they got to be done in a way that respects, you know, Mother Earth and, and our traditional values, right? And again, it's important that, you know, again, that those voices are heard. It's not just, it's not just checking a box. We've experienced that. No more box checking. Well, let's do this in a meaningful way and let's move forward together. Yep. Can, can I contribute to that a little bit, Ken? 
Absolutely. Go ahead, JP. So it's just, you know, I, I agree. Like we're at the press, we're at a major tipping point in this country when it comes to infrastructure uh, ownership. We're certain we're seeing billion dollar deals done, you know, like the Enbridge deal last fall with 26 nations and billion plus dollars invested. Um, from a mineral perspective, um, you, it's just a matter of time before we actually discover the resource and it's the access to capital is is where the launch off point is going to be a major shift for us and uh, yep. you've seen the announcement yesterday from the federal government for a loan guarantee program details uh, to come forward um, you've got Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation went from one to three billion dollars availability then you stack that federally provincially and then private sector um, debt uh, and then community ownership that actually brings a lot of certainty. And you got to remember our value of our land is our rights. And the land that we bring to the table also is a form of equity. Um, it's just going to be seen as natural business in the next 10 to 20 years where Indigenous nations got this resource. Let's stack on and let's all benefit from it because the alternative is not going to, we're going to spin our wheels. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. I think we're going to be... Um, um, owning a lot more of the critical minerals as we, as we go forward in partnership. Uh, and, you know, stories like the Taltan, you know, none of their kids are in care because they're the ones that are managing and they have ownership, part equity ownership on mining. And it's having, having tremendous value, a whole bunch of tertiary benefits to the community in our nation. And I love the Taltan example because they, I think, are involved with five or six different mines. Like they, yeah. it's not just one mine, it's not they're not resting on one particular property. But they've also said no to a mine recently mm. where they looked at it and they said, gee, you know, that one's just, we're, we're not, you know, problem. Point, yeah. Jason's point, you know, we're not anti-development. That mine is touching on sacred land and, and the harvesting is too important or whatever. So, JP, let me flip it around to another, another way of asking the same sort of question. One of the things that people don't understand is that oftentimes the building of roads and infrastructure can be the most disruptive part of a mine. It isn't the mine. Mines itself are actually often very small and we're being much, much better at tailing ponds and things like that and using dry tailing systems that mean that you don't sort of get the, the leaching of the chemicals and things like that. But there's a case in, in Western Canada where the development of, of exploration roads uh, basically resulted in one community going from harvesting 200 moose a year to harvesting 20. Because what happened is all the non-Aboriginal people could use these mining roads, get their ATVs to go roaring down these roads and shoot all the moose, right? And so so the roads themselves, and I think in Northern Ontario, this is actually a big problem. The That's the biggest the issue. Road, biggest issue. So Delva, so I want to make, make sure I, I thank uh, Ryan before for that first question that I asked to Jason before. But Delva asked the question of saying, okay, if roads are a problem, why can't we be using airships? Why, are, where, why is Canada not a world leader in exploring the capacity of airships to move all the supplies that, you know, we're talking about huge amounts of gasoline, huge amounts of construction material. Why are we not seen as being a world leader in those kinds of areas? Well, I, I, I'm not an airship, um, although I'd like to have one. I think that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> uh, expert in airships. I mean, it gets down to the economics. I mean, the, on the ring of fire here, the, the road goes right by my and Jason's community to like the main highway and then the tertiary road to get up. It's just right here. Um, and it's, you know, the environmental assessment process is being driven by the impacted communities, which is wonderful. Um, and, uh, you know, they'll have Indigenous oversight, but you're absolutely right. It is going to open up. So um, there are ways to manage uh, that for sure. And I think that's the biggest concern. You've hit it. So thanks for describing that, Ken, because it's, it's not it's not it's not the, it's not the eagle nest is the issue. That one mindset, they're actually going to be able to take the mine. They're building an underground mine, all the processing. There's going to be very minimal impact and they're going to be able to use that to help build the road. But it'll be opening up the region. And that's what we're as a country really, really nervous about. So it does have to have indigenous oversight and protected areas, has to have a, a land use planning um, um, process that is indigenous led. Anything that we do, it has to be indigenous led or you're not gonna get the buy-in, you're not gonna get the assurances. But I also want folks in the big cities, and I lived in Toronto, I lived in Ottawa, you know, I've, I've lived in the big cities. You're on land that once, once was pristine and your judgments on Northern communities for developing our backyards to advance our socioeconomic well-being. Um, if, you know, when I, you know, remember that story that I, that I got into the Toronto Star can about these environmental, you know, the extreme side, the ruffalos of the world saying, you know, these poor indigenous people, they can't uh, look out for themselves. We need to protect their lands. We can speak for ourselves. Thank you very much. And we're going to have the oversight about all this, but, 
we need to also have that opportunity. Now, Jason's talked about this. You've talked about it. Um, and maybe airships will be involved somehow. Ken, I'm not sure. There's so much incredible technology that is coming out now, and we need to explore all of it. But allow us, our communities, the birth to actually develop our resources and protect our lands as we as 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 we would as in, independent sovereign nations. Yeah, and I'm not sure, Jason, if you've had time to spend time in Australia, but JP and I have both been down. I've been down probably 15 different times. Just down there twice and, last month. <laughs> exactly, and 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 because Australia and Canada are very closely related on the mining front, there's lots of interaction between the companies and capital and all that sort of things. But one of the things they've done better in Australia in some areas is they they've actually kept areas where the mining the mining has not resulted in a big influx of del of other development in the area. It hasn't resulted in the flood people flooding in. So I've got a question here that Frank asked that, that um, um, if, if you look at our, our federal consultation processes, they're they're getting more complicated all the time. And and quite frankly, they're one of the best job creation processes ever created for non-Aboriginal professionals. So the consultation processes cost millions of dollars for engineers and environmentalists and historians and public policy people and all that kind of stuff. Very little of that money actually trickles down to the community for the consultations themselves. So when you look at the consultation processes and given that the government of Canada is urging the development of critical minerals, they, they put in place things that slowed things down. Now they're trying to accelerate those developments. How would you change the consultation process with First Nations? I've got a bit of a sense from what GP said and what you said before, but but you know those processes are now entrenched in law. How would you change them? I think, honestly, like I mentioned earlier, we have to lead that. We have to develop the rules of engagement. Again, and it's through you know having the resources to develop those those tools, right? I said because again, you know, like anything, it's not just a, a, a problem with indigenous communities or indigenous people, but when you're forced to do some, oftentimes you know the instinct is to push back, right? So if we can, you know, if we had the resources, the capabilities, the financial resources to lean on the experts, right? It was the same thing I shared you yesterday at our conference here. I said, you know, there needs to be a consortium of trusted advisors that are going to help us really move forward and, and, and give the community leaders the, the supports they need. Because unfortunately, oftentimes, you know, we're at, we're stuck at, in the community at the community level dealing with social challenges. Unfortunately, um, economic development doesn't sit high in the priority. Um, and I don't blame the communities for that. You know, they're, they're, they're dealt the hand they're dealt with. But I really think that, you know, if we have the technical resources to support, you know, development and ensure that, you know, we we truly understand what we're looking at here and the true value of the project, it would, we would be far better off. I'm of the opinion that, you know what, if we can do, a, if every community within Canada, Indigenous community within Canada had a, uh, a mapping, an asset mapping of every valuable mineral resource in its traditional territory, and they had that that data, man, we would be put in a really positive position where now we understand the value of those resources, yep. Yep. right? And I truly believe that, you know, that's, I, I don't think it's that far off as well. You know, the technology is there, they, you know, using, I think we as Indigenous folks have the ability right now to change and shift the paradigm of development to mm -hmm. one where on the offensive by using technology. And I really truly believe that. And I think, you know, again, the time is now, right? And finding the right partners, you know, we're seeing a lot more social responsibility from companies. Um, it's not just words anymore uh, on a website, <laughs> on a homepage, but you're actually seeing true meaningful engagement and uh, an effort to really be collaborative. And that's what we want, right? You know, I'm gonna tell you something, this is my perspective that, you know, I, I'm sick and tired of the days of having indigenous relations folks and you know, <laughs> stakeholder relations folk. Like, let's get Indigenous procurement champions. Let's get people that are measured and, and given the authority to make decisions so that, you know, they're not coming into community and getting chastised because they've been put in a really terrible position, you know, as Indigenous relations folks. So let's say procurement champion. Let's go recruitment retention champions, right? Like, again, and one of the things I've seen here, and JP alluded to it earlier about, you know, investors, you wouldn't believe the amount of investors here that are looking to invest in projects that include indigenous communities, organizations, ZEC Dev Corps. And that for me is exciting because, you know, there's people that you can just see the hope and optimism. And again, I think that truly is the 
the message that we're hearing. And again, that, that, that message is getting passed on to our youth. But they're going, you know what? I do have a reason to put my socks on every day. And yeah, you know, Canada, the country wants me, right? You know, we're still like, you know, my son brought it up. I got a 14, 15 year old kids at home, my boys, and, and uh, they talk about that youth suicide. We're still the largest demographic of youth suicide because our kids don't see the future. And I think through, you know, positive development and economic development and development of these resources in a meaningful way where we're not lining the pockets of big corporate where, you know, if it's if the money's intended for an indigenous community, indigenous group to prosper indigenous businesses through procurement and opportunities, then let's do it. Yeah. But I'm also a huge proponent of that. What's get me- what gets measured gets done. And if it ain't getting measured, and that's one of the beauty things. I've never been to Australia, Ken, to your earlier comment. But one of the things that I, I, I asked uh, the, the Wailu fellow when he was in Thunder Bay last year, two years ago, I said, when you talk about engagement, like how are you ensuring that engagement is happening, that meaningful Indigenous participation is happening? Because we've heard it. I've heard it many times. JP's heard it. We've all heard it. Well, it's going to be meaningful Indigenous participation. Project comes and goes. We're still sitting on the, out, on the outside looking in while, you know, the, 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 the partners and friends of, you know, the, the contractor, developer are lining their pockets and we're still sitting there eating eating crumbs, right? So what I loved about the response from Wailu at that at that uh, meeting was the fact that you know the metrics and performance measures are tied directly to their their their, their wallet, right? If they ain't performing and they ain't delivering, they yeah. ain't getting paid, right? And there's consequences to the to inaction. And I truly believe in any meaningful engagement and participation requires that there has to be a there has to be a penalty for 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 not hitting your results. It can't be a New Year's resolution where I'm going to lose twenty yeah. pounds this year and don't do it. <laughs> no consequence, right? There has yeah. has to be there has to be a consequence consequence to an action. Are you suggesting that should be my New Year's resolution? Is that the point? <laughs> you're yeah, I never said that. It's probably, <laughs> it's probably fair enough, but but I, I think that's a really, really important and valuable point you make about the the fact that there have to be consequences. You have to sort of monitor this. Um, we actually have some of the best best companies, mining companies in the world. The Canadian standards of this release relationship building is much better than it was 20 years ago, but it's actually better than almost anywhere else in the world, and that's that's a really good thing. That is moving in that direction. But Jason, I want to say something really quickly just so make sure everybody understands this. You you mentioned so quietly the, the, the social challenges. You mentioned the teenage suicide, which is an endemic in, in northern Ontario and a really serious sort of problem. I, I was talking to a, a an Indigenous leader in northern Saskatchewan, and their community is very heavily involved in the mining sector. They've got great relationships with Cameco, great employment programs and things of that sort. So I was having a conversation saying, well, how's it going? And he looked at me just straight like you're looking at me right now. And he said, our kids are dying from opioids. And it's, it's, it's nothing to do with mining companies. He wasn't blaming the mining company. He wasn't blaming the government of Canada. He wasn't blaming the CBC. He wasn't blaming anybody. He just said this horrible thing, this opioid epidemic is just going through our community. You know, and his, his comment was the same as yours. We've got to give them something to hope for that says, don't put that damn fentanyl in your mouth. You know, stay away from that stuff. Right, but because you've got these other opportunities out there, and we have to create those sort of other other visions. So, JP, I want to you know maybe only have time for a couple more questions, folks. You guys have been just fantastic. Um, if you look across the country, many people see indigenous engagement in the resource economy as being a liability. It's a barrier. It's a it's a burden. It's something you have to cross off. Jason referred to it as a tick a box exercise. You know, hey, we've done our consultation. We got that out of the way. You say exactly the opposite. And you argue that the role engaging with Indigenous people should be Canada's superpower. That, in fact, this is the one thing that will set us aside from everywhere else in the world. Now, that is so counterintuitive. Tell us what you mean about that. I, I agree with you, by the way, because I've heard you explain this before. But what, what is it about that <coughs> Indigenous engagement that is Canada's superpower? Economic reconciliation is our competitive edge. I fully believe that. And there are a lot of our allies that fully believe that. And when you unlock um, the potential of Indigenous knowledge, our workforce, our certainty through our land and our rights, it just adds significant um, um, ability to get uh, work done in this country. And um, we're starting to find our stride when we um, find a way to unlock those. And if I can just put it into... um, into sort of these four quadrants of theory of change and then put it through the procurements 
work that, you know, when I was running the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business and Tabitha is doing a great job moving that forward and procurement. Um, you know, we went, um, Mark Little and I uh, went to Parliament Hill to get government to start making a commitment, a 5% commitment to um, uh, procurement because we know that the business is the opportunity to create relationships. They're not, they're handshakes, not handouts. And so when you combine the heart, which are the stories of our entrepreneurs and our allies and our working together, and we've got lots of those great stories, and then you combine that with the data, which are the impact that Indigenous people can have in the economy um, when you when you empower us uh, and our people, um, as well as the you know the sixty thousand Indigenous entrepreneurs contributing fifty bill almost fifty billion dollars to Canada's economy. You combine that data with the heart, and then you combine the relationship. Industry can only go so far, and that's the unlocking part. So when you partner in a meaningful way with the Indigenous community through the engagements, through the trust building, through the opportunities to know each other, when you go together, industry, Indigenous, heart and mind, the stories, the data, you can move mountains. Missing components in all of this is the Indigenous relationship, and that's that engagement piece. If you're going in as a pick the box exercise, we're going to show you the back door as soon as you came in the front door. If you're there for and you're there to build relationships with us and you have a vision of of cooperation uh and and benefiting together and you know being in the trenches together we're, we're going to be in the room for a long time together and we're all going to benefit yeah and mark little was the president of suncor i believe at the time when you had he was the chief operating officer and then he moved on to the the ceo but uh, mark was a huge champion for us we got jason talked about the procurement champions we started that back in 2018 mm -hmm. and we had all these corporations who saw the value in procuring indigenous entrepreneurs to their bottom line mm -hmm. and to the relationships and then that went and like so the government goes oh my god there's you know one of the biggest corporations in canada indigenous people working together i guess we better pay attention Give us a really quick second. How much does Suncor uh, uh, procure from Indigenous communities on an annual basis? You'll have to go to our sustainability report because you people won't believe, but we spent last year $3.1 billion on the Indigenous entrepreneurs and businesses uh, last year alone. So my point to raise that, again, I'm sure, Jason, you'd agree with me, is that, and this is not to pick on our, our, our friends from Toronto or Vancouver or whatever else, is that the front lines of rec economic reconciliation in this country are actually happening on the re in the resource economy. These are these are big deals. They're sustained and they're actually helping s whole communities. I was talking to one one community where they actually had the mine just closed down recently, and they were you know this is real tragedy. The, the mine actually built their water system. The government was so, so slow getting their water system built that the mining company said, "You guys need a water system." They put a, a, a water system to connect up all their all their homes. Right, so reconciliation is happening faster in these remote northern regions than it is actually happening in the urban centers. I think it's fair to say, Jason, you've been doing this for a long time, even though you're still a young fellow, right? <laughs> and you've been involved with you have lots of different mining companies and lots of different mining projects. Um, what are the keys to success in terms of the of, of those companies with their engagement? What works? What do they What do they have to do to be successful with with indigenous communities? Honestly, I think they have to get out of their own way. <laughs> they got to start, you know, really opening their, their eyes to see what does meaningful engagement, right? Because I think oftentimes through my experience, you know, minds will look at, you know, um, local indigenous communities. Um, and if, 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 as my example is, if I don't belong to a local indigenous community, I'm, I'm excluded. Right. I, I don't get I don't get an opportunity. I'm, you know, further down the line than anybody else, right? I mean, I do truly value I I, I value traditional territory first of all. You yeah. know, I, I'm an ultimate. I have ultimate respect for traditional territory, um, but I believe that, you know, mining companies, energy companies, you name it, also have to look at indigenous businesses as a whole. As for my example, like I, I got 40 employees, majority of my staff are indigenous, majority of my staff are female. And, and I'm very much about ensuring that I'm utilizing as an indigenous business, I'm utilizing every business that's operating from that community and the near near adjacent community. I'm, I'm ensuring I'm employing their people. I'm buying my products and services from their community, you know, kind of doing an asset inventory of what they have. But working in collaboration, and I think you know, again, I think what goes unnoticed a lot by corporate Canada and in a variety of sectors is the reach that we as Indigenous people have within the community, 
right? Yeah. From from employment to to services to products, right? We're, we miss that. I think we get too narrow sighted as to what we're looking at. So I think you have to broaden that 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 mindset and go. You know what? Look at the track record. Look what they're doing, right? You know, again, if you go look at a lot of the, the folks I, I I compete with, they're not going to tout the same numbers we're touting. Like Warrior Engineering, we have eight employees. Ninety percent of our staff are Indigenous. You tell me another engineering firm in, in this country that I can <laughs> tout those stats, right? Yeah. I live it. I walk it every day. Right? That's yeah. who I am, and that's what we're all about. And I think at the end of the day, that's where you know the companies need to need to kind of get out of their way um, in regards to what is inclusion, right? Like I said, we we know inclusion. We walk it every day. We talk it every day, right? And you know, again, we work with communities to ensure that hey, this is who we are. We want it. We respect traditional territory. Respect your own, you know, um, plan for ec- economic reconciliation, economic development, and and respect your impact benefit agreements that were negotiated. But we also want to ensure that hey, we are here to support. You guys, yeah. you guys want us, your, your organization wants us, your community wants us. We're here to support, you know, it's through give back programs and, and hiring people, building capacities. I truly believe that's important, right? Unfortunately, we've experienced as Indigenous businesses, you know, a lot of, uh, unfortunately, a lot of tokenism, right? And I think as you peel back the onion, you'll start to find out who's truly an Indigenous business that's, you know, that's here for meaningful engagement and capacity building, right? You know, yeah. for us, you know, for me as an indigenous person walking into a business and seeing another indigenous person working there, whether it's, you know, the mining sector, energy sector, financial sector, it, 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 it warms my heart. That's just how I'm Our board of directors. And yeah, I saw board of directors. online, you know, you, yeah. you know, it's directors or, you know, they direct the CEOs um, yeah. and direct the strategy of companies. And that's really important. There's, there needs to be more of us on boards. You, you you guys have been wonderful. Thank you, Jason. It's wonderful to have you with us, JP. Again, thank you so much. I'm giving you one minute each to sort of wrap up. And just, uh, JP, start with you. What are your what, what your last takeaways you want to make for today? Well, folks need to understand that Indigenous people are not a monolith. And you've got two leaders here at the on the... Uh, on this call, Indigenous leaders, um, and our, uh, we're pretty progressive uh, and forward-thinking and very socioeconomic focused. Uh, not all communities uh, support research development, and that's one of the biggest challenges that we face now is figuring out that space between communities and letting communities figure it out for themselves instead of getting in the middle of them. Um, they'll, they'll, they'll come out and they'll let you know what they're, they're looking for. Um, and I also just, lastly, we need... Um, political courage to move forward when it makes sense for communities and support them when they want to go, support them in every way possible. Yeah. Courage is the one item that's in greatest shortage in every society in the world, I think. Jason, your last thoughts. Thank you, JP. First of all, again, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's always a pleasure to sit in the panel with JP. Uh, but I applaud all you folks that are here today and participating in this, in this webinar because you obviously have an interest in reconciliation and, and we need more allies. And, uh, you know, I think for us is that an allyship, friends that are willing to do. We need to doers, right? We're in an era of reconciliation, but I heard the term coined before where it has to be reconciliation. We need actions. Words without action are simply words, right? And it's important that we start moving forward. We start, you know, again, we've, we've been patient enough. I'm probably the most patient man in the history of the world. Like I've been sure. <laughs> yeah, I've seen fish. you fish, Jason. I don't know why he's going to let that long of a pitch in the fish. <laughs> yeah, I know. But again, like I said, we, we, we want to see prosperity. I, I, I want to see it for our kids and the grandkids. Yep. And you know what? That's for me, that's, that's everything, right? Like I say, you know what? You know, no more living, you know, 10 people in a two bedroom house. Like that, let's, let's, let's change that mentality to one of, of, of self-reliance and, confidence and you know prosperity because i think that would be a, a game changer for all of our, our people and uh you know again i i i used this term once before and i was at a conference i said you know when you see a homeless indigenous person on the street i hope you see me and them and them and me because it's only a matter of circumstance where they're at they are and i'm at where i'm at and yep. uh you know again i think you know the future is, is quite bright but it's going to take action and like jp said it's going to take courage so let, let's let's move that needle 
Well, you, you guys are wonderful. I really appreciate your thoughtful comments on the, and appreciate the audience being with us. This has been just terrific. Um, on behalf of McDonald Laurie Institute, I think cannot thank you enough for sharing your ideas, your insights. This is how we actually make change, folks. We do this together and do it collaboratively. I was, as I was thinking about what I would say as my final comment, it would be this. Even the way we phrase this is some of the critical minerals. We use this word all the time. Critical to whom? There are not people in Northern Ontario sitting here saying, oh my gosh, if I don't have that lithium coming out of the mine near Lake Nipigon, I'm gonna, my life is going to change. Well, you, no, that's not it. These are critical minerals for people living in the South, living in the industrialized area, living in other countries, right? And, and the minerals can be critical for an, Aboriginal people. Historically, they've been critically damaging. They've left really solid negative legacies. And it's a really interesting sign of Indigenous resilience and determination that you see the optimi reason for optimism going forward. There is a better future ahead. Um, the one advantage of being older as I get, as I get older all the time is, is the, dif the difference over the last 50 years is stunning. And I project that 50 years forward, and you're going to have half the mi new mines in this country will be at least half owned by Indigenous, indigenous communities, and, and all of them will be co-developed with Indigenous communities. You folks have set us on a great path. You've helped us understand how critical mineral development might happen and might be accelerated in this country. I thank you very much. On behalf of the McDonald Laurie Institute, thank you, everybody, for being with us today. Jason Thompson, you've been terrific. JP, you did the best you could do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thanks, guys. You. Thanks. Thanks, JP. <laughs> Can I tell you so, my joke now? Yes, please tell